All right, you want to see something kind of cool? Check this out. So right here, I'm cleaning off the slag off the top of the melt. Grab it with some tongs, pour it down a sprue, and poof, I have a rough cast piece. Check that out. Now that I have your attention, hello and welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'll be showing you the method that I used to cast one of the aluminum parts that I was getting from PCBWay before the tariffs were enacted. The first part that I've been setting up to cast in-house is the gimbal. I could go back to machining them from a block of 6061 T6, about three inches cubed, but where I have casting as an option, that feels like taking the long way around to get the job done. Unfortunately, the finished geometry of this part isn't one that I'm able to cast in its final form in one go. Because of how the top ear is shaped, there really isn't a way to orient the part so that the shear line is perpendicular to the ears. Even when I try canting the print in the Petrobon, I still can't get a clean part. One of the main issues I keep running into is the amount of time that it takes to prepare the molds. If I'm going to adopt this way of making parts, I need the process that I use to impress the molds to be relatively quick and repeatable. The more variants that I introduce along the way, the less consistent that the parts are likely to be. What I've settled on, at least for making this part, is using a two-piece flask that has tabs that reliably and accurately index the flask one to another. This allows me to use two 3D printed bucks instead of using one buck to start the mold and swapping in a plug of the part to impression the other half of the mold. Hoping to get the perfect split when you separate the two halves, which almost never happens. This has turned out to be one of the biggest advantages that I've found by doing things this way. You never have a piece of the top mold stick to the bottom, ruining everything, causing you to knock everything out of the flask and start all over again. Something that has worked really well for me with using Petrobond and 3D printed molds is designing the buck with at least four degrees of draft. This small change greatly reduced the amount of breakout and need to rework one or both halves of the mold. Another thing I figured out is using cornstarch based baby powder works pretty well as a release. It ends up burning off without causing too many issues. Real life talcum or mica powder does work better, but over the last couple of years, it has become super hard to source outside of special ordering it from Amazon. It seems everybody has lost their mind over talc potentially containing trace amounts of asbestos. Let me start out with the legal. Vivorf sent me this 1350 watt melter with one and three kilogram graphite crucibles for review and other than getting to keep this unit, they aren't compensating me in any way for this video. These are my words, and they don't get a first look at the video. So, how is my experience with the 1350 watt electric melting furnace so far? I've done right at 20 cycles with this setup. With what I've been doing, it's performing very well. Surprisingly, it doesn't leak a bunch of heat. The only part that does get hot is the flip up lid. The temperature control of the melter is pretty basic. There isn't any ramp and hold programming available on this unit. And to temper your crucible for its first use, or when you're warming everything up at the beginning of your melting and casting session, you'll need to do your set and hold temperatures manually. But once you've burned all the moisture out of the crucible and got it up to working temperature, it seems to hold the program temperature pretty reliably. Something to keep in mind is crucibles, graphite or ceramic should all be considered consumables. And depending upon where you're sourcing your information, you should expect to get between 25 and 50 firings from your crucible before you should start thinking about ordering a replacement. Of course, there are a few things that you can do to help you get the most life out of your crucible. Your crucible does not like rapid temperature swings. Going from 10 degrees to 1,000 rapidly is likely to cause it to crack. For what I'm doing, primarily melting aluminum, I don't just run it up to 800 degrees. I break that transition into a couple of steps. I start off at 300, then go to 500 degrees, letting it rest at each step for about 45 minutes to make sure that I've burned off any moisture that has been absorbed by the crucible, before finally setting the controller to 800 degrees. 
Second thing you can do is avoid excess heat. It won't do you any good heating everything up to copper temperatures if all you're doing is melting aluminum. Also, don't mix materials in your crucibles. Have one set up for aluminum, another for copper, brass, gold, and silver. Finally, don't let the metal solidify in the crucible when you're done. Get as much of what you're melting out of the crucible as you can before it cools down. You don't want the expansion or contraction rate of the metal to cause your crucible to crack. Inevitably, after a couple of firings, you're likely to have a little bit of slag or dross that gets stuck to the bottom. As long as it's relatively thin, let it cool down to where you can safely handle it, and then using a piece of L copper pipe, pick at it until you're able to get the majority of it out. What I've done when it gets to be too much for that is gently chucking the crucible in my lathe, and with a boring bar, slowly whittle away at the stuck bits until you can peel the majority of them out. Lastly, do your best to avoid thermal shock. Let your crucible cool down as slow as you can, and always place it back in the furnace to cool when you're done for the day. To summarize, slow on the way up, slow on the way down, only heat it up enough to get the job done, and leave as little as you can in the crucible when you're done. Also, particularly when using graphite crucibles, don't use borax as flux, or to clean the metal that you're melting. Borax is super corrosive to graphite clay, and will cause it to prematurely pit or flake off. Now, that isn't the case if you're using a ceramic crucible, although you shouldn't be using ceramic with aluminum. Different metals favor different types of crucibles. Something else that'll help with improving your results, don't melt dirty metal, particularly aluminum. Always clean the metal that you're melting, at least with a wire wheel, preferably with a zirconium sanding disc. The cleaner the metal going in, the less slag and dross that you're likely to have at the end. The material that I've been using for these parts came from the cast aluminum housing of a hydraulic auger attachment for a bobcat. Aluminum is super porous. That being said, when it comes to melting, you don't want to use any metal that has been in direct contact with oil. It's contaminated, going to smoke terribly, and generate a pile of slag. Avoid using transmission housings. Instead, look at using something like damaged car wheels. They're generally forged using a decent alloy and will usually give you pretty reliable results. Of course, different types of aluminum will have different rates of flow and only be able to cast certain levels of detail. You can get super off into the weeds as to which aluminum casts best and has enough strength for your project. Generally, material that flows really well isn't going to be super strong. Likewise, harder material isn't likely to flow super free. A little experimentation and you'll figure out what works best for what you're doing. By the book, pure aluminum melts at 660 degrees C. I've had best results with the least amount of slag with this melter set at 800 degrees. And using the one kilogram crucible, Filling it up about three quarters of the way full, it usually takes right at 40 minutes to go from pour to pour. When you're first trying to figure out the volume of the aluminum that you need for your part, it's my experience that when you look at the crucible and go, yeah, that's probably enough, go ahead and add some more metal. It really sucks to go through all the work to set everything up just to be short on the pour by one or two ounces. And do not underestimate the volume of metal that goes into the pour sprue and runners. So, now that I have the rough shape, what's next? Well, the plan is to use the three quarter inch stob that I added to the model to act as both a zero index and means to fixture in the fourth axis of my CNC mill. When I designed the 3D printed bucks for this part, I added 1 16th of an inch all the way around along with the four degrees of draft so I should have more than enough material to carve my intended finished shape from this rough cast. I'm sure I'll do a video about finishing this part out in the near future. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Thanks for watching.